Welcome everyone on this sunny, cooler Wednesday afternoon. We'll just take a couple of minutes to have you settle in and, and join us, but we welcome you on behalf of the Long Island Board of Realtors, and we have a very special guest here with us today. Thank you, Mary. Look forward to being here. It, it, it is a beautiful day, that's for sure. Yep. Gorgeous day. I know, I know. Little break from the hot, hot weather that we've been having, but I do love it. Yeah, we tried we tried outdoor events many, many years ago as people are joining, which are beautiful. The problem was um, we did one by the beach for an event at, out at Gurney's. Yeah. And uh, there was a plane overhead that with, with one of the banners that they fly. Mm -hmm. And it was so loud that we couldn't, we couldn't talk loud enough for the event. It was just yeah, very right. funny. Right, right. Well, Zoom keeps us safe and keeps Gosh. us in, indoors and, and it's been very uh, beneficial for our members and uh, very popular with our members. I think they sure. appreciate the opportunity. I think it's gonna be, um, I think to stay with a long time. And I, I find it like your, your uh, education event was just so spectacular. It was yeah. just a great design. It's something new for everybody. It's great. Yes, yes. Love it. We have another association upstate who is um, looking to do the same thing. And I have a list of about 20 questions after our um, Zoom meet that I have to give them feedback. So imitation is the best form of flattery. Sure. And I'm anxious to help them to get them, um, you know, their efforts off Good. ground. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a gal from Albany that was interested in a lot of things. Yes, yes, yes. Is that, yeah. Debbie Isom, yeah. Very nice, yeah, very nice, yep. That was a great event. All your events are great. So, thanks, Andy. So, oh, let's see. It's twelve oh two. So, let's officially get started. My name is Mary Ann Monteleone. I'm education director for LIBOR, and I'm happy to be here today with a very, very special guest. Excuse me if I read off the paper because I don't want to miss anything about Andy. Thank you, Mary. So Andy Thaw has worked in the mortgage banking industry for over 35 years, mainly in loan originations and business development. His primary focus has been working with FHA, 203K, and Fannie Mae Homestyle Lending, where he has been considered an industry leader for the last 25 plus years, and has written two widely used books on renovation lending. He has worked extensively throughout his career as an industry partner with the New York Housing and Urban Development Office and has written numerous industry publications and best practices training curriculum. Andy has been a featured FHA speaker and renovation trainer um, throughout his career nationally as well as a New York State Certified Continuing Education Instructor proudly teaching for LIBOR. He is currently the Senior Vice President of Renovation Lending for Jet Direct Mortgage Bankers Headquarters in Bayshore. And I welcome um, a friend and a great guy, Andy Thaw. Thank you, Thank you so much, Marion. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and I, I know the uh, whole Zoom uh, type of event like this, but I do hear the applause out there. I hear it coming yeah. my way. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you so much, and I welcome everybody to the event. And um, we're watching as participants uh, join us this morning. And in this type of um, this type of event, where it uh, not being a CE class or or specifically technical training class, we're trying to have an open discussion. And what I'd like to do for the next forty five minutes or so is to raise um, awareness of what's happening within the uh, lending arena. All right, which I know we're all so part of, and it's so um, important to our transaction, as you probably know. Uh, so as I do that today, I would like to also say that as these topics come up and the conversation develops, please feel free to to um, join in on the chat or the questions, which I know Marianne is going to help me watch. But definitely for today, I, I kind of look at this kind of like a town hall type style meeting. Uh, I'd like it to be informal, but I do have some nice topics I think we'll cover, which I, I know is going to raise a lot of questions of how it pertains to you. So again, as Marion said, this is my 35th year. As a matter of fact, this week is my 35th year. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I love what, what I do. I love the real estate community and the lending community. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. So with, with that said, let me go to share my screen. And once I get that up, uh, I'm going to use my PowerPoint as a backdrop here 
to kind of talk about what we'll be doing today. And the topics are really uh, a success within the marketplace. And whereas, again, we are so intricately involved with our transactions, as you know, from, from the real estate standpoint, uh, along with your with the lending partners, and of course, in the state of New York with our attorney partners, and, and also very importantly, that our title company partners, uh, as you know, Title, the title portion of the transaction is uh, usually handled through the attorney's office, um, it's, and it kind of just happens, but it is an important topic what we're going to kind of touch upon today as well. So it, today, what I'd like to do is to touch about kind of where we're at with the marketplace ever since you know, 2020 came about uh, from a, a number of reasons. Um, one, how what's happening in the market, how it's affecting your lender partners, you know, which I'm going to span on today. But more importantly, not only how it affects us uh, on, a, on a downside and on a very strong upside as well, which is a great thing, uh, but also how that relates to your transactions. Uh, obviously, we're not all becoming loan officers today, um, but we really want you to understand or have a good feeling for what's happening on the lending side. And we're going to be t talking about some tips about how to be success in what we call the distance world. Uh, and I'm going to expand on that with the markets, um, more of a 2020 world, you know, which affects everybody. So that is my topic today. And um, I kind of break it down in segments. I've used this before um, from another class that I put together called On Your Mark, Get Set, Clear to Close. And I kind of break things out in a segment. And if you read the the uh, follow to this event today, uh, clear to close being one of the finest three three words in the in the dictionary in the real estate market, as you know. And I'm going to kind of talk about that, how we're getting from on your mark or from a pre-approval standpoint, talk about the different phases and, of course, getting to that clear to close, but also really more importantly, again, more so about how the markets are affecting what we do. And I'm going to share some tips about how I believe your lending partners are adapting uh, to get your transactions done successfully. So with that said, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the... Um, what's happened or kind of put things in perspective. Um, so when real estate and lending professionals have always survived and grown through markets, if you are um, a seasoned realtor and have been around for many, many cycles, uh, you know that, listen, we're, we're always in an up and down cycle, whether it's um, a, a seller's market or a buyer's market, uh, economic trends tend to follow us, but we, we've always, always gotten through marketplaces and we will with this one as well. Um, there are, are different cycles that we've been through, which I'm going to touch upon, but more importantly, to get us to, to where we're at today and kind of in a comparison, you know, my little uh, friend here on the screen, you know, everybody doesn't really know what an underwriter uh, looks like in back in the market, but this is our head underwriter. So I just want to share that with you. But <laughs> so we have to uh, make sure we get our loans done, but only joking in case they're out there. But so basically the cycles of home prices, as we know, are up and down. And I think we all know kind of what's happening with the marketplace right now, where uh, ever since the markets opened up after we were deemed as essential here back in the spring, uh, we're seeing an amazing amount of activity for, for homes and therefore driving up home prices. And we're experiencing a lot of bid, bid openings or bidding wars going on. And as Marianne brought up recently, we were talking about this earlier, that uh, realtors are finally saying to themselves, that they're seeing that a lot of consumers are looking because of COVID issues to come back in out to Suffolk County or come back to the to the island or maybe even going north where they're looking for more land and more space. So we are seeing a trend of that nature, which we'll touch upon today as well. Um, another thing that we've gone through are historic rate swings, you know, going back 35 years in my beginning of my career, we were selling loans when, when rates were 17, 18%. I'm sure we, some of us remember those days. And I remember for good nine, 10 years, 15 years of my career, there were people who were uh, pleading, please, please get me a rate in the nines. You know, I don't want to be in 10%. And, you know, so everything is relative, you know, and, and one good point here, which we'll talk about today, what's happening is that rates, as we know, are just absolutely historically low, uh, which is helping creating home ownership opportunities. So we are going to talk about that today too. But the point here is that when you have rate swings, again, our real estate market always survives that. Um, 
and and we just have to find a place because home ownership is always a, a, a need driven type of market. So we're going to touch upon that today. Economic downturns up and down. We've we've been through. Um, honestly, usually a cycle for an economic turn usually takes a year or two or three. There's trends, but I will tell you the economic downturn because of COVID. Of course, we know in 2020 has has been taking shape on a monthly basis. So I am going to talk about that shortly. Um, we've lived through 9/11 cycles, you know, as we know, and, and the 2000, 2007, and 8 meltdowns of the market. Um, there were differences in those times, which we'll explore, and I want to compare to you on a good basis of what's happening this year. So bottom line is, we brings us to 2020 life events, and we know that this is historic everything because we, we don't have precedent. We don't have something that we've looked that happened 10 years ago. There, we've gone through economic turns. We've gone through cycles of turns. Uh, however, not that's been caused by something of this type of life event. So I want to put things in perspective as time goes on. Uh, so again, uh, it's not the same here. 2020 is not the same as it was. Let's look at 07 and 08 uh, at that time. Uh, in 2020 here, the difference in 07 and 08 is that at this time, being apples and oranges, we, oops, sorry, uh, is that we have, we do have strong growing world markets, unlike 07 and 08, uh, that, again, we had very, very diminishing world markets at the time. And what I mean by world markets, I'm not talking about the real estate community or people buying worldwide, but I'm talking about the financial mechanisms that drive rates and drive the actual liquidity that that it is that drives the mortgage lending arena. So I'm going to expand on that. In 2020, we started with extremely low unemployment. You know, we had a great marketplace. People have been working for a few years. As you know, unemployment was down, which always spurs activity within, within the uh, consumer confidence arena. And that's, again, spurs sales, as we know. Okay. Uh, so the strong, we've had very strong consumer confidence for many years now. Uh, we've had active real estate markets. And again, at the same time, when we're at an intersection of just unbelievably low interest rates. Um, Marianne asked me this earlier, what, what, what are the rates? And if some of you out there are curious, well, I'm sure you've heard it. We Interest rates right now on most, most products are in the mid twos, two and a half percent. To, to the high twos, maybe into the low threes. So depending on the kind of product that they're going for, whether it's conventional or FHA, um, or even a no-income check type of loan, which they're still out there right now, they're coming back, uh, interest rates are just historically low. And from a qualification standpoint, that does help to make home ownership that much more affordable. So let's look what happened here. So now in COVID, and I want to make drive these points home, is that in COVID, now since that time frame in the last number of months, now we're starting to see historic unemployment. But a word of a word of the month now or the word of the year is furloughs. All right, we've seen a lot of uh, of our buyers who have been furloughed, so that may have been pre-approved. But of course, then unfortunately losing their position, however, temporary or maybe permanent, but furlough, furloughed employment has definitely been creating a problem within the industry. We're now seeing national forbearance and deferments where Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all of the GSCs in the country, uh, as soon as COVID hit, to help consumers with home ownership um, keep their homes, they came out with forbearance programs so that, so that the homeowners did not have to pay their loan if they were for in forbearance or, or if they needed to defer a payment. So that is a wonderful plus side for consumers, but it did create an extremely difficult position for the industry, uh, for the lending markets in that uh, created a very tight liquidity issue, which we'll kind of talk about as we go as well. And the reason for that is because when, when a consumer makes a mortgage payment to the lender, the lender basically, whether it's Fannie Mae or whoever owns that loan, they then make that loan or the interest payment to the liquidity markets or the actual end users or whoever purchased the paper on the Wall Street markets, mortgage-backed securities. So the point is, is that once a consumer is told that we can defer payments or we're gonna issue a forbearance, the thing is, that payment still has to be made by Fannie Mae or the bank that holds the loan. It still has to be made to the Wall Street investors. So here they're making the payments on the left side, but now not getting the mortgage payments from the consumer. That created a very, very short-term liquidity issue, which is being fought through the industry. Um, we've lived through now of months of being non-essential, which created a huge backlog, but we know 
as realtors what you've been through for that. Fortunately, we've, we're definitely come out of that in a very good way. Um, and again, as I'm saying, uh, compared to 07 and 08, uh, the capital markets, because of what I just mentioned to you, that drive the actual uh, funds that we use in our mortgage markets, uh, they're running for cover. And uh, we, we started out going very badly in the spring. Then things loosened up beautifully. Uh, based on certain things that the administration did, but now it's starting to get a little scary again. So we'll, we'll touch bases on that. Uh, the good news, again, is that nothing here is broken. It was only interrupted. So credit policy is loosening up. Uh, capital markets, they are rebounding, which is a great thing, okay? And on a monthly basis, the one thing about from the lending side, I'll tell you, is that your lending partners are meeting the challenges. Uh, I think you've seen that and adapting on a monthly basis because we do have to adapt on a monthly basis based on the overall criteria that's being uh, given to us on, on, from a national level. So that's the good news. The good news, our markets have not been broken. They've just kind of been interrupted based on COVID. So that's a much better thing than it was back in 07 and 08. So with that said, let's talk about a little bit about your on your market set and clear to close. Um, I will say that more than ever, uh, Hands-on attention is extremely important. Technology is coming coming to our tables, just like your Zooms, like we're doing today. But lenders are adapting a lot of different technologies that to to speed up the transaction or to be more efficient. Uh, and communication and teamwork and old-fashioned expertise is so important at this point. And the teamwork thing is going to be very very important when it comes to the timing of your transaction, which we'll talk about. Um, so. Let's, let's kind of talk about how we look at this. So let's say you're on your mark, meaning that you're in the beginning of the transaction, you're looking at the whole pre-approval stage. And one of the things that's changed, or, or better yet, best practices are becoming much more important, is that uh, when you're looking to be pre-approved from an from a originator standpoint, we don't know if a particular property has been chosen yet, if one's been in mind, or if they're just kind of looking at that. But either way, as they start to look for properties, the pre-approval or pre-commitment stage is extremely more crucial now, even more than ever, for a number of reasons. Okay, And with that said, your loan officer really needs to cover uh, all traditional issues much so much more and also have more considerations that need to be in the thought process. And it's just much more important to, which I'm gonna expand on, to look at that from a pre-approval stage, uh, uh, to think about what I consider, I'll jump over here, that says to begin the transaction with the end in mind, meaning that you have to envision the closing, all right, getting that clear to close, and then think backwards, what is going to take to get that, and also shift your thought process our originators here in this distance world and the way the markets that we're in is to shift the workload early on in the transaction. And I call that the heavy lifting. And what I mean by that is that when you're at the pre-approval stage, if you think about a good strong pre-approval um, or a pre-commitment is one whereby the transaction has been so well documented and so well covered that once that transaction begins and goes to contract, the actual processing stage is that much easier and much more efficient because a lot of the heavy lifting of what's necessary for that transaction has hopefully been done prior to even going to contract. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, I've had pre-approval, I've had a, a, a deal looked at by the lender, so why do they sometimes just take so long or why do they come up with problems? Well, sometimes I, I used to say, a pre-approval is only as good as the person that signed it, you know, sometimes, uh, or the company that issued it. But the, the bottom line is <clears throat> we are in a very changing environment right now. So for those reasons, the loan officer really has to, at this time, do the heavy lifting up front, begin with the end in mind, start your transaction as if you wanted to close it within a week even though we're not going to, but that's how you really have to approach it. Um, uh, uh, so while I'm going here, do we have any questions or thoughts about what I'm referring to at this time or some experiences you wanted to share for a moment? If not, if not, I can always go on, but I just wanted to see if anyone had any thoughts or what, kind of what I'm getting at here. Um, what we're gonna do, Andy, is um, have anyone who has a question very informally raise okay. their hand and we'll unmute them. So, um, if everybody finds that under the participants, if you click on that button, you'll see everybody who's participating. And at the bottom on the right, it, it says raise hand. And we'll um, 
we'll unmute them and they could ask a question. All right, very good. Okay, so if not, I, I can always, I'll keep proceeding and keep building on what I'd like to discuss. And uh, Mary and I appreciate you watching for that. And please feel free to interrupt because a lot of this will take shape and I'm trying to lay the groundwork of kind of a lot of my um, uh, thought processes here. But the, the trick here when you're pre-approving is begin your transaction with the end in mind Okay, and loan officers, you want to shift your heavy lifting up front, meaning document, 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 and cover issues as best as possible. So with that said, here's what we're doing here. Uh, one of the things we really need to do, of course, which at this point is not as big an issue, is that we were looking to verify the employment status as, as being essential through the New York State websites. You know, for a while there, we had to make sure that their jobs were considered essential. If not, chances are they lost their employment or they were furloughed from their position. So even if they were pre-approved in January or February or even into March, chances are as time went on, they may have lost that position. <clears throat> and when you're thinking about you're out there having a pre-approval from let's say April, and now you're in May and June still looking out there, you have to make sure that that pre-approval or that documentation is still up to date uh, so that nothing's changed between the pre-approval stage and as you're looking for a house and getting more focused on a particular home. Extremely important. Um, let's look to see what we do here. We document, document, document. Um, I know you've seen these things before, but it, ever more important, it is just so important to get your documentation from your, from your consumers as much as possible up front. And what a lot of lender partners are doing now also is that they're actually taking the supporting documentation, W-2s or pay stubs or what have you, and they're actually them calling the employment, actually doing employment verifications so that we can, we can see that, make sure that they, yes, indeed they are employed and we're actually getting the verifications done. And the reason for that, one of the tricks here, of what I mean about the heavy lifting shifting it up front is that sometimes because a lot of the employers out there were working remotely, sometimes the sources where we got our written verifications of employment that we normally do during processing, they may not be as attainable or quickly enough because, because the human resources departments from these different companies may be working remotely and it sometimes takes longer. So that's kind of part of the little tricks here of what I mean by cover your bases up front all right, as much as possible and get that heavy lifting done out of the way. It would really only help your transaction that much more. And one of the things I'll tell you in adapting here is that lenders are using a much, much more digital technology uh, or mobile apps that we use to obtain documentation, which really can save, uh, I'm gonna think even more than 20% of time. Uh, it is more efficient than ever to directly receive documentation from the cell phone. I will tell you that next year in 2021, um, unless we have a volcano erupt on Long Island, okay, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, the Fannie Mae loan application, the 1003 loan application is changing its style. It's changing the whole 1003, what we call the application is changing. So it's going to become much more conducive for digital technology later on. And I do see that happening already. So that's a good plus here. But the, the key here, guys, heavy lifting, make sure that your deal is pre-approved strongly. Uh, and even to go as so far as to get verifications of employment, uh, to get a lot of that out of the way, to make sure that everything is still like it's supposed to be. Um, here are some of the considerations where we've adapted. Uh, we have to basically, prior to every pre-approval, we verify that any changes to the loan product or the qualifying guidelines. Uh, we must verify the essential appointment list as soon as possible. Uh, we ask the simple questions to the consumer. Hey, are you working? Are you furloughed? We have to understand where they're at and what's going on with that. And, and a lot of the good part here is that now in July and August, a lot of the companies that were furloughing their, 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 um, uh, their employees are now are, are back to work. A lot of them are back to work full time, but you have to make sure that's, that's the case and that it's still going to continue. Extremely important. Okay. Um, we, I mentioned before about the human resources to make sure that the management will be available for verifications. That's important. Um, one thing you want to do to speed your transaction along is that will assets need to be liquidated? So we ask our consumers, depending on where the money is coming from, if they're getting it from a 401k, again, the 401k administration might be on remote or might be furloughed themselves 
because the back office of corporations are usually uh, the ones that, that go furloughed first. You have to make sure that they can access their funds. Just these little tricks and tips that you want to be thinking of when, when you're looking at a transaction. Um, we want to be prudent more than ever with qualifying ratios because the industry is telling us to be from a qualification standpoint. And what I do is when I pre-approve somebody, I, I always think about pre-approving them with a little bit of higher interest rate. So even if the interest rates now are two and three quarters, you want to think to yourself about, hey, let's qualify them at three and a quarter so that if there is market movement, which is much more volatile this year than it was in years past, we know that that qualification is still uh, good and solid, okay? Um, and again, it's very important that you as agents just really, not that you have to be your loan originator, but just keep that communication going. And one of the tips I would, I would wanna know up front uh, that I always ask realtors I work with is that um, know your seller situation, okay? Uh, it's not all about the purchase price, it's about the scenario of the transaction. What's the owner about closing date? Are they selling a home to buy the home? Is there a domino transaction going on? And the reason we want to know that is because we need to know the time frame of what an expectation is so that when we're looking at interest rates, we want to lock them into a very good rate uh, and still cover the, trans the timeline of the transaction. So if we know that where they're going to contract now, but they're not closing for three months. Well, we know that we, we have different things we have to look at when looking to lock interest rates in. So it's very important to know the, the seller's situation, not just purchase price, but what is the course of the transaction that we're expecting. Kind of important, okay? Always set the tone of the transaction. Always begin with, with the end in mind. It's something I always like to say. And Basically, more preparing for success in the distance world is, is that we have to really look at the relationships between the attorney and the lender, our appraisers, our title companies, because it's that coordination of everybody working together in tandem that's going to be extremely important. And if you don't, all right, it's hard to get to that finish line. We need to get your deal done. There's a lot of moving parts that have to be done. And by shifting the heavy lifting as a lender, we, we want to make sure the attorneys are doing the same and the title companies are doing the same so that we obtain as much information up front as possible. Okay. And when you don't, again, you know, whoop, think about it. Hold on a minute. You think about these types of things happening. So just imagine you know, you're looking to get your deal, you're in contract and you're getting, and you got your pre-approval in mind and then it's passed off to the underwriter and you're getting close to closing. And Oh my gosh, I forgot to, um, the interest rates went up and now we have to go back and relock the interest rate. Oh, I handed it off to the attorney, but the attorney is taking a vacation for two weeks. Oh, I almost closed, but if I got to get a water reading, that's going to take two weeks because the municipality is closed. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? They were furloughed. We almost were ready to close, but they lost their job. So, you know, this is, the, this is our lives, you know, we're going crazy. And I know what's happening out here. And I think you can all, kind of relate to that. So thanks for joining me this morning. And <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But the, the bottom line here is that it's extremely important that we really coordinate with all parties here. So the, the attorneys have also adapted in that attorney firms are also working remotely. Uh, I think by now you kind of see how they're working differently, whether they're working staggered hours in the office or working remotely. But fortunately in our, in our arena for many years, we've been doing contracts uh, by, by email and back and forth. It's not like the old days of sitting down and doing a contract at, in, in uh, an attorney's office at a conference table all at once. So we're kind of used to that type of working remotely on contract time. Um, Basically, I don't see that much changing here from the attorney standpoint, um, but it is extremely important that we, we get the terms of the transaction from a timing standpoint. One of the things I've seen is that once we, we have an offer accepted, that, and this just happened to me recently, where it's an REO, it was a, an honor before contract date of 30 days or 45 days, but it took two weeks to get the contract signed. Well, what's happening is that same 45 days still apply. So sometimes you're losing some time frame in the transaction. So we just really want to have all parties very aware of what the closing requirements are so that, again, we all know to shift the heavy lifting up front. And 
and get the contracts done as quickly as possible. And, but more importantly, that we all understand the timeline of the transaction, okay? I think contracts are being done electronically. Uh, the one thing I'll tell you is I know a lot of attorneys I work with are deploying electronic signatures, of course. Uh, some don't, but most of them are. And of course, they're receiving the down payment funds by wire. So a lot of this has taken shape and a lot of it, best practices from an attorney standpoint to, to get into contract has been kind of being followed uh, right from the beginning. But one of the changes I, I always ask the attorney again is to order your title report as soon as possible. And the reason for that is that we are better now than we were, but the municipalities were closed or the municipalities were downsized uh, so that the title reports, the departmental searches that the title company does was taking a lot longer to get the information for the title report. So one of, again, one of the tricks, get that title going right away. Um, Suffolk is slower than NASA when it comes to things like COs. Um, Long Island is a little bit slower than, than the boroughs. So again, the trick here, again, is at time of going to contract is let's get that, let's get that title report going. It's extremely important. So really what they have to do is to get early on with the county, the township and the villages. Um, it's important to get that title bill to the attorney and to the lender. Um, and the title company or attorney will need to look for those issues early on. So one of the things we have to do also is that if we know a, a transaction is not going to close, let's say for a month or so, when we get that title report, it's important that we do the title review because if there are issues on title, whether it's an open permit or an issue with a survey or a line adjustment agreement or whatever it might be, or a violation for that matter, that that be addressed early on as in transaction. Uh, and how that affects the, the transaction is that also, let's say from a rate standpoint, if we've locked the interest rate for 45 days and now we have a delay on title, well, again, the markets might change. Uh, or you might have to pay to extend the rate. So my point is we're all connected and it's important that we really uh, look at our transactions and try to do all the heavy lifting up front as much as possible to get any of the gray areas out of the way, okay? Extremely important. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about technology here. Uh, lenders, I will tell you, are advancing very well with technology. As I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm doing this 35 years and um, I'm used to doing this when they weren't even using fax machines in those days. Um, and when we did in the beginning, then they used to use that thermal paper that used to go out. Well, we've come a long way since then, unfortunately, but in the last year or so, especially this year, we're seeing so much more technology by using mobile apps where we can obtain documentation encrypted right from the consumer's cell phone, all kinds of different things that, that we can use and lenders really are adapting by using so much technology. I know the real estate community is doing that as well. So any thoughts or questions? Uh, let me raise it. I'm not kind of watching that myself, but any anyone would like to contribute at this point? Uh, for something that they're seeing from a pre-approval standpoint or a transaction that was delayed for a reason? If you do, please feel free to uh, raise your hand on that. Any thoughts? Okay. I guess we're covering it well, so I'll, I'll keep asking, but please feel free to uh, go back and forth because uh, every scenario is different. You know, I used to say, if you've done a hundred deals or, or better yet 50 deals, you've seen it all. And if you've done a hundred deals, you've seen it all twice and a thousand deals, you've seen it all 10 times. You know, I always used to say that because it, it's just experience of what to anticipate. But I, I have to say, I don't know if I can say that anymore because we are, we are seeing different things that are just happening out there. So here's some more tips I want to share with you of what's happening on the inside here. Um, I mentioned before, you know, we have to be in constant communication. I know we as a company internally have daily uh, departmental Zoom type meetings because we really have to keep up with what's happening here with a lot of the uh, researching that we're doing with industry updates. Uh, locally or nationally. So let me expand on that a moment. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that on a monthly basis now, uh, we're getting word from the national organizations, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, the FHF, FA, Federal Housing Finance Administration or agency. Uh, we're getting a lot of national um, word on a monthly basis and changes in guideline and approach 
that are affecting rates that are affecting a lot of different things. And what it's doing, it's really looking to, it's setting the tone of how lenders are beginning to lend. Now, I will tell you that we were very, very strong in that a lot of the qualifications, a lot of the underwriting criteria had loosened up there for, for after a while. Uh, in early spring, and they still are for that matter, by the way. But um, I'm starting to sense certain shifts here now as we get into the fall because uh, there's a lot of fear that because of, of the uh, forbearance issues and a lot of the deferred payment issues out there that uh, uh, furloughed and, and, and looking at COVID ramifications, that the national agencies are thinking that there's going to be a lot of defaults out there. I'm not sure if you heard this, but they imposed uh, on a national level a half a point pricing adjustment to the lenders on all refinances in the country. I'm not sure if you heard that. Now that, and not only did they do that, uh, but they did it like that without any notice or any kind of an advance uh, grandfathering in. So lenders were caught with a lot of refinances, like thousands of refinances that all of a sudden were hit with a, a pricing adjustment on that. And what they're calling that, they call that a loan level price adjustment. Um, and what and the reason they did that is because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are looking at their, their numbers and they're looking at the performance of loans and how many people are going into forbearance and how many people are looking for deferred payments. And what they're expecting, they're expecting expectation on a, on a percentage basis. Of course, this is just projections, is maybe uh, losses in, in the amount of about $6 billion is what they're expecting over the next year. They're thinking, uh, this just a communication we received even yesterday and this morning. They're thinking they're gonna lose about $4 billion in liquidity due to forbearance defaults. Uh, $1 billion are thinking based on foreclosures and a billion dollars in servicing liquidity that they're giving to Fannie Mae and giving to your servicers because they're losing money when consumers don't pay to make the payments. So that doesn't affect new transactions. However, it sets the tone in the industry of, okay, where are we leading with this? Where are we leading with this? So once I see that, that in my mind, knowing, knowing what happens over the years, they, they may then start to adjust qualifications because they want to make sure that newer transactions being done uh, have much stronger compensating factors. Now, I don't see that yet. I still think we're in a fantastic place from qualifications and what have you. Um, however, these are things that are looming that we're watching on a, on a daily basis. So it's important, very important that your lender watches your, your database, watch, um, I'm sorry, their pipeline of loans so that they make sure that they're locked in so that they, if they have to grandfather a current loan into a scenario prior to changes, they'll do so. And that's also part of the reason I always say, try to get your title up front, try to do the heavy lifting up front so that you secure your transaction prior to any changes. You know, It's just that everything is a little bit more compressed now based on the environment that we're in. It really takes expertise and uh, experience to kind of watch that, okay? And some of the things that we're monitoring, again, that we adapt to are the daily and weekly changes to guidelines. Um, we're watching for daily review of current loan qualifications as well with regard to rates and income, income ratios. Um, we're looking at the need to document and verify buyer's employment and income right up to 24 hours before closing. This is something that we're also doing. Uh, lenders are required so that once you go to contract and we process their loan, it used to be that the documentation we received was good for 120 days. And usually a lender over the years would get an updated pay stub or verification of employment uh, within the 30 days of, of, of closing. We're now required to do that verification either the day of closing or the day before closing to make sure they're not furloughed, to make sure they're still on the job. All right, it's very, very interesting what's going on here. Um, very, very important. And also what's happening here with self-employed buyers, same thing. Self-employed buyers, because they don't have pay stubs, there's a whole new set of guidelines having to do with that uh, in that we have to now request uh, two or three months of bank statements in their business to show that their cash flow is the same as it was the last two years. Because they don't get pay stubs, there's no way of us knowing that their employment is, is constant and their income is constant. So these are the things where it's getting tighter within the marketplace 
also with self-employed buyers, if we're going to use that income uh, that we do get from their cash flow from the bank statements, we also want to see that they have a 12 months of reserves of the mortgage payment in the bank after closing. So they're really looking for a lot stronger uh, criteria when it comes to self-employed buyers uh, for, for a lot of obvious reasons. So the, I will, I'm just trying to share with you the mindsets of what we do. But the important part here, I, I will tell you, is we are still in a very strong part of the cycle. Uh, the After February and March and, and April and May, things really did open up beautifully. And most people were in our marketplace, went back to work, not all, but most. So we are still seeing a very strong market with, with rates. We're seeing a very strong market with um, employment, uh, a lot much better than it was, but they're starting to watch to see what happens in the fall when, when everybody goes back to school and if there's gonna be spikes with, with the um, situation as we know. So this is just kind of the mindsets of what we do here. And um, so a lot of the tips that we talk about, I wanna talk a little bit about appraisals as well, is it, this is an important slide because this is something that we look at and how we need to adapt and your thought process. So let's kind of paraphrase everything and put everything in perspective. Uh, we set and review the tone of the transaction right from on your mark. And what I mean by that is just make sure that we do a good job. We set the tone of the transaction. We know their employment. We know their income. We know that we can get our verifications. We know it's going to be a 60-day transaction. <clears throat> we see the interest rate that we've qualified them for. We know the tone. So right for on your mark, right in the beginning, we kind of know where we want to land with this. Okay, Very, extremely important. And that sets up my, my tip number two, which is you begin the transaction with the end in mind. And that's what I meant by that. You, you know where you want to close. You know what you need to close. Think backwards and set your loan up that way right from the beginning. As a realtor, again, it, it, it doesn't affect you other than knowing that your lending partner is applying and approaching your transaction in that manner so that we can avoid some of the movements and the moving parts within the industry. Get it locked in, get it all set to go. And honestly, it's a smooth transaction. Get it all out of the way. Then we can kind of coast and just have a good time here. People can actually... Um, uh, set their, uh, get their moving trucks on time. So we don't have to rush to the end is what we're saying here. Okay. Uh, we shift the heavy leaf in order to do that. That's my last tip. So remember, set the tone from the beginning, begin with the end in mind. We shift the heavy lifting. And these are the tips that we do to really help stop the moving parts of your transaction. We want to communicate constantly with the transaction. I'm speaking more with my industry partners, my attorneys, the realtors on the deals to make sure that we're still on the same tone if there are any changes that come up. Okay, I just had one recently where we're going to contract, but something came up on title. Uh, we know that it, it's, it could affect it. So the, I know the agent who know very well, she's a broker, knew to go down to the town, coordinated with the attorney, but we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have the, that, a lot of that information up front. So we're shifting those responsibilities up front get the moving parts out of the way. Happens on a daily basis, okay? Uh, important thing here too is to work your deals concurrently and not consecutively, meaning that a lot of, in the old days, while the lender is working, the attorney would, the, the contracts are done, then the, then the lender gets involved, then the attorney gets involved, then the title company, et cetera, but it's not a handoff anymore. Things need to be done concurrently together at the same time. And that's what's, that's what's changed a lot over the years. And I cannot stress the importance of it this year. I mentioned the rate shift. So therefore we want to lock our rates. Um, and one of the other things that's changed here, I think we all know about the good old CD, you know, uh, based on TRID requirements, as, as you know, for a few years now, we as a lender have to issue the CD or closing disclosure, which took the place of the HUD one years ago, a number of years ago, we have to issue that at least three days prior to closing. So delivering that CD or getting the actual math or the numbers together earlier on so that we issue that CD and we meet the national requirements of what they call TRID requirements, okay? And so these are the tips that I always try to say that given the environment of what we're in this year, this is really gonna, all of these approaches will always help your transactions uh, to the end to get to that clear to close mark, okay? Um, especially the CD. By the way, TRID, I get a lot of questions about the whole TRID requirement. Um, 
what TRID stands for, honestly, I get a lot of questions about that. It, it came up from the Dodd-Frank bill and all the different legislation that happened throughout the years. Uh, TRID really stands for Truth and, Ren Truth and Lending uh, RESPA Integrated Disclosure. That's really what it stands for. And it's just a method that lenders are required to how we disclose the transaction to the consumer. All right. And part of that whole change is how we're then to deliver the closing information to the consumer, not at closing, but at least three days prior to. So that's that's what happened with this whole TRID thing. All right. On a federal basis, they if you ask them what does TRID stand for, they say to really identify dopes, okay, on a national level. But we know it means truth and lending, RESPA, integrated disclosure. And it just set the tone that we have to issue the closing disclosure earlier on, all right, to satisfy those requirements, okay? It's help, It's there to help the, the consumer uh, to look at the numbers. And it, however, it, it does shift the responsibility to make sure that we as a lending community and you as a realtor also, by the way, to get the information of your of from your broker or the information over to the lender so that we can issue a good CD to the consumer. That's the reason why a lot of this has happened. I just want to kind of go on there as well. Okay. And lastly, let's talk about appraisal a little bit. I get a lot of questions about the appraisal. Um, there was a question that was posed, Mary and actually brought it up with um, come in, uh, a discussion with a broker, uh, Nikki, who was a broker who raised this question recently. And that had to do with, you know, when, you, when you're shifting uh, uh, values of homes that are, that are accelerating in, in a marketplace uh, that are quickly going up, how do the homes appraise or what are the appraisers doing when, it, when you have a transaction where you've been in a, let's say a $500,000 marketplace, and then all of a sudden we're seeing overbids and, and the homes are going for 10, 20, 30, $40,000 above the, the listing price. Well, that does happen throughout the years. Uh, it's a cycle and what, and it does become problematic or it could be because remember appraisers work off of closed data, as you know. Um, so what happens is when you have an accelerating marketplace, it comes a little bit harder for appraisers to appraise because there's no data already that supports that. So if your transactions are the first of its kind moving the marketplace up, where do you get that data from? Well, a lot of it is market driven and um, they do not use, we used to call that time adjustments on an appraisal, but without getting too technical, but we really don't see positive time adjustments in an increasing market. But what really helps the transaction is that if you have an increasing value within a particular market, a lot of those consumers, chances are, if they're putting more money down on their transaction, let's say they're putting 25% down or what have you on their transaction. And what happens is when we lend, we lend off of the appraised value or the contract sales price, whichever is less. So what happens is if your property in that, for instance, in that example, if it appraises for, let's say, 5% uh, lower, well, what happens is it doesn't affect the, the borrower transaction, even if it appraises a little lower from a lending standpoint, because we still go up, we still have that 20% equity. So chances are, if we have a, a greater money down transaction, we have that room before it, it affects the lending purposes. And the more and more data and transactions that, that close, we then have tangible data for the appraisers to support the, the increasing values of the area. That's kind of what happens. Um, but I have better news for, on, on the appraisal front because uh, I, I, after sharing a lot of these tips, I want to get it back with also some questions is that on the appraisal front, um, if you've taken some of my classes in the past or you may have heard this in some presentations, we've been collecting appraisal data as an industry on a national level, the FHA, Fannie Mae, has been collecting every appraisal that's done in the country, now is required to be uploaded into these national systems, okay? This happened many years ago. I don't, maybe eight years ago, approximate. And they called that appraisal, they call that a UAD appraisal, Uniform Appraisal Data Set. And that's the kind of appraisals that they're doing. And they call it that because the appraisals the style of the appraisal has been changed so that they can collect this data over the years. And what they've been doing is collecting all this data from every property that's sold on a national basis. Um, and and the, the upside to that is that now that they have so much market information, uh, there's 
<laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that, but bottom line is here's the advantage. Here's the plus. I'm starting to see transactions now on a purchase transaction whereby we get a waiver where we don't even have to get an appraisal. Okay, it's already starting. Uh, it happened to me just two weeks ago on a transaction. So that if the purchase has enough strong compensating factors in the purchase itself on the consumer side, and if the property is in an area where they have a lot of market data, and if your, uh, your purchase price is within that data, the lender is getting starting to get word or a finding here that we do not, do not necessarily have to even get an appraisal. So that's something that's starting to happen here, okay? I'm not sure if it's happened to you guys, but I'm starting to see it, and that's a plus of what's happening right now. So uh, these are the really wonderful tips I'm going to share with you in this, this distant world, if you will, or in, I'm going to say, a 2020 COVID world of what, where things have been affected. So again, I'm going to ask for questions or any thought process so we can get some conversation going on. Uh, anybody have any thoughts that you really would like to share or, or situations you'd like to add at this point? No, um, Marianne, Dan, I think we... Yeah, down at the bottom, you can hover over down at the bottom and you'll see a raised hand. If you raise it, I'll see it and I'll, I'll unmute you so that you can ask Andy um, a question. Uh, we do have one question. What's about okay. the, the average time it would take from application to approval? Okay, it's a great question. Um, the average time from application to an approval. Well, let me, that's a very good question. Um, uh, from an application to, I'm gonna call it a commitment or what I'm gonna say a conditional commitment or a conditional approval. That's the key word here, the word conditional. Uh, most lenders, what they're doing now is that once it's a, the loan is originated, rather than going to the processor of the loan and the processor sends the consumer a welcome letter, hi, thanks for, Thanks for flying us. And here's a list of things that we'll need from you to finish your loan. And, and then it gets to the underwriter two weeks later or three weeks later. What they're doing now is it goes right from origination. It bypasses the processor, goes right to the underwriter. And the underwriters now more commonly will underwrite that loan right, right up front, okay, with strong documentation already. So that rather than sending an opening letter, they actually issue a conditional commitment to the consumer and to everybody so that we know that yes, based on the supporting documentation, we have our commitment and here are whatever conditions we need to finish the transaction. And usually when they do that, it, so we get a commitment right up front, usually within the week, and then, then it's up to the consumer. Um, and it also depends on how well the loan was originated up front because remember what I said, if you do your heavy lifting, okay, that means you've gotten all your documentation, you've gotten all the questions answered on that transaction. Your underwriter is issuing the conditional commitment right away. And if it's a good one, hopefully it's not conditioned for anything much more than your appraisal and title. So that's how we get things rolling more. So I'd say from a clear to close commitment, um, it's being done in less than 30 days these days, most, most of the time, barring any, anything unforeseen. But we, the lenders have adapted to technology and adapted to this mindset of beginning with the end in mind. We're getting conditional commitments, usually within the week, that sets the tone of the transaction. And then usually we can get our conditions, especially using technology, uh, usually within a good three-week period. I'd say that's the, the norm that I'm seeing out there. Wow, that's that's. Great. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that one point adjustment that um, you mentioned before on, I think, refis? You said lenders were given that. Yeah, that's setting the tone on, even though obviously we're a real estate community for today's event for purchases, but it kind of sets the tone to the lender of what's going on here. And the FHA, FHFA, the, the Federal Housing Finance Agency of the feds, Basically, what they're saying is that they came out with a, they call it a loan level price adjustment. That's what we call it, an LLPA. What, and what that means is that, let's say we're issuing a refinance and, and we're, we're offering a two and three quarter percent uh, with zero points, let's say, okay? Uh, now, what happened was just like that, they came out with this new guideline that because they're worried that, and I'll explain why in a minute, they're seeing that because they're expecting more people to default based on forbearances and, and deferred payments and all that. They're, they hit they hit every loan with a half a percent, a half a point pricing adjustment on that particular deal. And what it means is that that two and three quarter percent interest rate 
that the lender was charging zero for, they may then impose that impose that same deal where they charge two and three quarter percent interest rate and charge the consumer half a point. So, so whether the lender passes that extra half a point price adjustment cost to the consumer, or if they if they hold on to that and do not pass it on to the consumer, it either way it's 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 affecting the pricing of how we do our loans. Now, here's here's what happened by the way. <clears throat> when it, and this is what happens in the markets. When when something like that comes out, that's by the way, that's historic. I've never seen that in all my 35 years of such a pricing adjustment for every refinance in the country. That's just crazy. But what they're doing, um, it sets the tone in the industry where the tone starts getting scared, the markets get scared. So I'm telling you within one day, all right, we didn't see a half a point adjustment in the cost. The lenders overshot that nationally and they imposed a one and a half percent price adjustment, which affected rates just like that. So now that it's kind of leveled off, okay, it's kind of gotten past it. Here's the good announcement. The announcement just came out yesterday, by the way, that now they're delaying it. So rather than taking effect September 1, now they came out and said, okay, we're going to delay it to December 1, okay, after the election. So one of the good things here is that we are in an election in an election year, and in all my experience, they like to keep things status quo and the economy looking as strong as possible. So this quick thing that they did, my opinion, was something that maybe there was some negotiating going on that we don't know about. But the bottom line is we had that quick adjustment that had to be passed on to the consumer overnight. But the good part now is they're delaying it till December, so we'll see what happens. Crazy. It was crazy. Crazy and interesting. Yeah. Um, and and um, I guess our last question is, uh, how are the closings being done? Are they online closings in person? Okay. Yep. Let's kind of see. Uh, I'm going to get past this cute little thing here. <laughs> okay. Um, let me kind of talk about that. What's happening with closing here, the good old clear to close. Um, we talk about the bank attorney and the title closer. What's happening is the documentation was starting to be done electronically, all right, for a while, whereby the attorneys were working remotely. So they were starting, the lender will always, uh, everything is done online so that we can send our closing documentation to the to the bank's closing attorney, all right, to, to get ready for the closing. Now, that was then shared electronically with the buyer's attorney, all right, to set up the closing, and uh, more importantly, with the title closer. So then the title closer, all right, and also the bank's, uh, the bank's closure or bank attorney closure was receiving the documentation electronically. You know, normally what's been happening now is that we started to go fully online, but in the state of New York, there was, um, there was a one issue having to do with certain documents <clears throat> still needed to be wet signed. Okay. By pen, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry. And one of the issues had to do with notarization and we call that RON or they, it's, it's called RON or remote online notarization. So many states have adopted that, whereby the notary can work online. They call it RON, uh, but New York had not adopted that as of yet. So, so most of the most of the lending that I see, um, because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all of the national organizations were still not hopping aboard across the board, most of the thing what's happening here is there the documents are being printed out, and usually the title closer and or the bank attorney will either go to the office. Um, or have them come to the office and go to the home or the real estate office. And what they're doing is they're, from a distance standpoint, they're spreading out the closing while either on two tables. They're basically getting social distancing going on here. Um, and I used to call it, a, forgive me for expression, but I, we called it a, a divorce closing where you'd have one party in one room and the other party in the other room. Well, so we're, we're starting to see that more where depending on the infrastructure of the office, uh, they're just practicing more social distance guidelines, uh, whereby they're closing still with wet signing, all right. But but fortunately, the title closer and the bank's attorney closer are able to then receive everything electronically, uh, and print everything out and just kind of bring it to the closing. That's that's kind of what we've been seeing. But I know every lender is kind of doing it differently. But that's I think has been the norm out there. Yeah, I think that's that's the safest way, and we're going to see that more and more. We uh, are. Yeah, um, I, I think that's about it. That was so okay. so very helpful. So um, 
beneficial and, and um, we want to thank you from LIBOR and the participants and the realtors for being with us, Andy, and we look forward to you being with us in the classroom as well. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, be well and safe and thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you. Okay.